Welcome to this week's rant, which is entitled, Don't Get Scammed by DHL. But we'll come back to that in a minute, <laughs> as we so often do. Um, so this week, uh, as you're aware, the JX8P has arrived. Now I've done a video on the JX8P and I suspect that video will be posted before this video, uh, based on uh, uh, post-production timescales and limitations. And the limitation of course is, me, because I do all the post-production. So, <laughs> um, and I know that the uh, the other video I filmed and I have got, it's gone through post, so I suspect that's gonna arrive before this one arrives. Anyway, <laughs> this has arrived and thank you uh, to Richard H for lending this to me so I can video this in the Goldfish Bowl. And I will just lift up this beautiful JX8P synthesizer that he has actually brought back from the dead. It wasn't particularly well when he acquired it and he's done a lot of work to actually make it work. So, um, still annoys me, I still catch my, my finger on that thing. Um, anyway, uh, I've never owned any of the JX um, series synths. Um, and for those that don't know, there were kind of three synths in this, in this range. And I say kind of because, I'll come on to this in a minute, but there were a load of MK MKSs, which were effectively these kind of in, in rack mount firm versions. So we ended, we started off with the, the JX3P, which was the younger one of this. Then we had the JX8P and the JX10. I'm not quite uh, sure why the P was dropped, uh, and the 10 is quite often known as the Super JX. Um, but mind you, having said that, the JX, 10p does look a bit odd in the marketing material where you've got two characters dash two characters anyway um, So what I thought I'd quickly do is I'd quickly run over some summary stats um, Of these three machines and I'm not going to go into great detail because there'll be other videos that go into more detail about the, the three machines but effectively, you know if we look at the JX3P uh, which was the first of the three machines. Uh, that came to market in 1983. I only really had a two year lifespan, was discontinued in 85. It was 61 notes uh, similar to this. It could do six note polyphony or voices as they called it at the time. It worked on the same two DCO oscillator structure that this thing uh, uses. It had 32 factory presets, 32 user presets, um, it couldn't, it didn't have a cartridge much what, what like this has. It did have MIDI, MIDI was present. It didn't have any aftertouch, didn't have any velocity. You needed the PG200 programmer, not this one. And the MKS equivalent was kind of the MKS30. If we look at this particular machine, this one was introduced in 1985, the year the 3P was, was discontinued and it ran on to 1989. 61 notes, six voice polyphony. Uh, same two DCO uh, structure per voice. Uh, this one up to the factory presets to 64, but you still have 32 presets for users. Um, this one does have a cartridge. It's the M16C. Uh, it has MIDI, it has aftertouch, it has velocity, uh, and you need the 800 programmer, which is what's sitting here beside me. Um, and the rough MKS equivalent was the MKS 50. And then we move on to the Super JX and a quick rundown of that. Came out a year after this in 1986, but was discontinued the same year as this. Um, it had the slightly wider keyboard, which was the 76. It had the ability to do 12 concurrent voices or 12 note polyphony. Um, and six in something it called dual mode. And I'm not 100% sure what what dual mode is and I've not got into it yet, so that will be discussed in a separate video. Still the same two DCO architecture that this has. Um, or if you're in dual mode, it actually had four DCO architecture. So effectively, you halve the polyphony and two of those DCOs are actually applied to the same note. So you end up with four. Um, the terminology changed on the JX10. Uh, uh, instead of uh, factory presets, they then started using the word tone, which was uh, uh, 
a terminology that Roland have continued to use ever since. So it had 50 factory tones, 50 user tones, and then 64 patches, which I'm not quite sure I quite understand the, the logic of um, being divisible by eight and then all of a sudden being sort of base, 10 base T. So 50 and 50 is 10 base T and 64 is still divisible by eight. Hey ho. Um, it had the slightly bigger cartridge uh, for storage, which was the 60 M64C. Again, standard MIDI, standard aftertouch, standard velocity, exactly the same program, the PG800 programmer, uh, but the kind of equivalent in MKS was 70. Um, so, you know, that was kind of the, the makeup of these synths, um, but it kind of puts the, the, this synth in context in terms of where it's at, a within the 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 JX range, it's the middle one. B where it was equivalent to the MKS range, which was the the range of uh, rack mount synthesizers that Roland were pushing at this point in time for studio use, um, and uh, you know people who had limited space. Uh, so and obviously it also sort of puts it in context with the the D50, because the D50 came out in 1987, um, which I've said on the other video was slap bang in the middle of the production run of this, and a year after the JX10 was released to market. So there you have, this is has been loaned to me uh, for the next few weeks. I'm going to be doing a series of videos on it, and uh, and then I'll give it back to Richard and say thank you very much, and, I'll, and we'll see what happens after that. <laughs> So this is indeed the part of the video where I do the channel self-promotion, which goes along the lines of, we must observe parish notices. So if you haven't subscribed to the channel and you like videos about this sort of thing, or this sort of thing, or these sort of things, or that sort of thing, um, hit the subscribe icon. If you want to be notified, save time hit the bell icon, that will notify you every time a video drops onto the channel. And I try to publish three to four times a week. Um, my mind's gone completely blank. I normally do this patter straight off and my mind's gone completely blank. Uh, where were we? Oh yeah, thumbs up. Uh, <laughs> if you like the contents of this video, please give it a thumbs up. It helps the video. And also, I really do love you guys leaving comments about the videos. I read them, I respond to them, and sometimes they actually form the, the subject matter of videos going forward. So please carry on doing that. Um, we are getting some very healthy uh, conversation strings in, in, the, in the comments. Um, also down there is the address of the TMTG community. So for less than the price of a cup of coffee, you can keep this channel rocking and rolling and help support the production of this stuff and the acquisition of um, synthesizers to actually show on the channel or allow me to go and pick them up from people and stuff like that. Um, thank you very much to everybody who is, is a Patreon. You are really helping and there is another thing that I'm gonna sort of bring up and something else that you help the channel buy, which really helps in terms of the production of the channel. Um, anyway, final thing down there is the uh, Instagram and Facebook feeds. Uh, what's really becoming apparent is a number of you are actually starting to contact me on Facebook and Instagram, which I really do uh, like. Um, now, I apologize for Facebook because whereas Instagram almost notifies me instantly, for some reason Facebook isn't. Uh, and I quite often find out that you sent me a uh, a message a few days after you sent it to me. So I do apologize for that. It's just, it's not showing up on my iPad, which is kind of uh, the main thing I use for that sort of uh, communication. Anyway, they're down there. Go and follow me, uh, follow the channel, and that's where all the channel notices are posted. But now back to this particular video. Ha <laughs> ha. Now, the subject of this video have you been scammed by DHL? And it's not necessarily DHL, so I'll just put that out there, but it, you know, I wasn't gonna list all the other ones. Um, anyway, for those that watched The Rent a few weeks back, you know I was talking about eBay fees. Uh, and when, and a part of the buying and selling on eBay, of course, is the postage, 
or getting goods from you to your buyer or getting goods from the buyer to you. Um, and this is probably more from the buyer to you rather than you to the buyer, but it, it works either way. You know, you have to sort of think about this. Um, now, if you if you know about um, eBay and you've been using eBay for a while, you know that there are two types of of postage effectively. You've got the postage that is internal to the territory you live in, and then you've got the the postage that goes cross border. And uh, I have to be honest and say, I don't often use the eBay postage system. Uh, and the reason why I don't use the eBay postage system is because I find the eBay postage system extremely slow. Um, and I also find it quite expensive in terms of how much does it cost the person buying from me. I can normally do cross-border um, much, much cheaper just by using one of the local couriers um, in the UK to send across a border. Um, but that is a discussion for a different video, to be honest. And uh, as I said, while I've used DHL in the title of this video, it's not actually limited to DHL. I've had spoof messages from FedEx, I've had spoof messages from UPS, uh, which are the kind of more global carriers, as well as the Royal Mail, which is the UK's incumbent carrier, uh, and DPS, which is, the, is, is mainly a, U, a European carrier as far as I can see. Um, so what is the scam? I hear you ask. Yes, we've got this far and I haven't actually told you what the scam is. Well, basically there are two types of scan that I've kind of come across, right? The first one, type one, is you get a text from what looks like the courier saying they have a package for you and there are additional fees to pay. Uh, they don't go into details about the fees, they just give you a link to a website and uh, you, go, you can go to that website uh, to pay these fees or they ask you to call a telephone number which is typically an 0800 number which is what a lot of um, companies do. Um, if it's a mobile number you know instantly it's a scam but if it's an 0800 number you think you're calling the, the right company. Um, uh, you can normally tell that the website is fake because uh, the courier would not send you to a website for argument's sake that is not DHL.com or RawMail.com. Um, but they are starting to get clever in the way the website name is constructed um, and often use the name DHL somewhere in the website, but not DHL.com. So, okay, DHL are the only ones who use DHL.com, right? And if you see something that says um, dhl.something.com, that's not DHL. And it similarly lines to the other um, manufacturer, uh, the other courier companies. They only use their own website. So if you see a website that is not their website and go to their, and the, and the way around this is to, is to go to their website, but I'll come onto that in a sec. Um, and the best, to be honest, the best website scam I've seen so far is uh, where they have actually written the, the, the website domain address in a Cyrillic character set rather than a, um, an ISO character set. And it has subtle differences in the character definition. So I'll give you an example, and I, I can't, I've been having problems actually putting it, putting it into a little thing, but I'll try and get it up in the same. If I don't, I apologise. But if you look at the word, the letter A in lowercase in the standard ISO format, that is like that, okay? And the Cyrillic version of that is basically that. It's, an, it's, a, it's a circle with a tail. That's the Cyrillic, and it's not an A, but it looks like an A, and you know you could be spoofed to a website that has a domain very very a domain name that looks right unless you looked at the actual characters being used and it's it's actually a very difficult one to spot but it is one of the best I've seen. Um, uh, if the text contains just a telephone number, then it's almost definitely going to be a scam. Uh, effectively, you ring through to the telephone number, you you basically ring through to Scam Central they um, tell you there is a, an amount to pay, 
it's normally quite a low amount. They don't normally charge you a huge amount because they're not trying, they're trying not to register on the, the fraud systems that the banks and the credit card companies operate. Um, and then they take your card number and then over the pay course of the next few weeks, few months possibly, they will then start to have a go at draining your bank account. So that's, that's, the first, that's the first type of scam, it's the text. The second type of scam is around uh, sending you an email saying there are, fee, there are fees due. Um, the good emails will actually use the logos of the courier company. Some of these are copied and pasted from pasted into the email. Others will load the logos directly from the websites. So a lot of um, courier companies or a lot of, of, of companies now rather actually embedded uh, the images in the emails, actually put a link from the email to um, the courier website. Um, so it looks like it's coming from the, so you know, if you click on, click hover over the, the images, you see the link to the actual website, um, which kind of makes you think it's coming from the courier company, and it's not. Um, but you can quite often spot it's a scam because you look at things like what email address is it being sent from? Again, using the the um, the argument of, of DHL or Raw Mail, they won't send you an email from joeblogs.com or fred at some other address.com. Okay, their emails will come from dhl.com or rawmail.com. They won't come from anywhere else. You know, this is the first thing to spot. But what they do is emails have uh, two display types. So they have what they call the customer friendly display, which is Fred Smith. And then they have the address display, which is Fred Smith at some other address.com. And if you hover over the email address on most um, phones and tablets and email clients, you can actually see the true email address as opposed to the customer friendly address. Okay. So uh, I actually have mine set up to um, show the email address, the proper email address rather than the custom friendly address. But that's purely just so I can spot this stuff quickly and hit the delete button. Um, the other giveaway is never click a link unless you know where it's taking you. So in an email, quite often they say click here. Um, if you're lucky, the scammer has just put a link in the email and you can spot the link. It does not take you to the courier's website takes you somewhere else. It might look like the courier's website, but it's not the courier's website. Um, most scammers will try to hide the link by putting what they call a readable name ac across the top of it. Again, it's a customer friendly name. Um, and that will show you, you know, the courier, it will say DHL payment page or something like that. Um, but if you actually look at the link itself, it's taking you to uh, scam.someotheraddress.com. Okay, so it's not taking you where you think it's going to take you. And also, if you look at this, it's sort of like if it has DHL buried down a string of, of text or something like that, that's not the DHL weight payment page, okay? These couriers, if you're going to make a payment to them on their website, they will have the payment details on their website at DHL.com. Or they will tell you they are taking you to PayPal or taking you to somewhere to make that payment, but you will always go from their main website. Um, so that's the second one they do. But however, you know, the other thing is about these links is you don't know what's what's going on when you hit that website. Because that website, not only could it be trying to scam you out of money, it could actually also try to be installing malicious code on your device, okay? So they can then start tracking your movements. So, um, you have to be careful of that. You really have to be careful of that one. Um, so that's kind of option two. And I said there was there was two, and I actually wrote down three here. Um, and the third type is um, actually unsolicited phone calls. So all of a sudden, you get a phone call from telling you uh, from somebody telling you that you have fees to pay and seeming to have knowledge of your order. Okay. Um, and either what is it or who the sender is. So, and, and pretty much, you know, basically, if you look at um, anything you get from overseas, um, and I've got it, I've got something here, I've got a box over here that I got from overseas. Ooh. And, oh, I'm gonna put this on camera, but 
there's a box, right? And that label there actually has your name, your address, and a description of goods, because it has to have those to clear customs. Okay, so that's what that's what that you know anybody who's involved in that process could quite easily get a mobile phone, take a picture of that, and they've got your details. Um, and I've had this uh, fairly recently, actually. Um, well, I say fairly recently before Christmas, when I ordered some goods from Toman in in Germany, and uh, the goods have been delivered. And I then get a phone call from the courier company saying that there were fees to pay. And I said, well, really, you know, I've got the goods. And I never heard of, I never heard of Dickie Bird about it again, because, you know, all of a sudden, you know, it was, well, hang on, you, you've got them, so it's not as if we're holding them up for clearance. They've already been delivered. But that was a really good example. And I've got on my phone, and my phone's not here, an example of a text saying that, you know, there are fees due. Well, I haven't ordered anything, so there can't be any fees due. Um, but, you know, that came through in the last few days, that particular uh, uh, text has. So either way, um, uh, you know, the, the, going back to the unsolicited phone call, it's, it's trying to present a sense of urgency. Your goods won't clear customs unless you pay us some money. Um, so why do we get fooled? Um, I suppose that's the next thing to ask ourselves. Well, it's simple. The scam test uh, text or email arrives about the same time you're actually expecting a parcel. And as I said, you know, if you look at that box that I just showed you, that says that there is a parcel in transit. Now that, because that's physical, that takes an amount of time to get from the port of entry to wherever you are. Okay, that's, that's reality. That's what happens. Um, so if the scammers can get to you in that window, then the reality is you think that you know there's some problem. Quite often when things clear the border, especially in the UK, um, you know, you will get a, a a message from the courier company to say there are additional fees to pay. And I quite expect that quite often because of things like duty and VAT. Um, but as I said, somewhere in that chain, the scammers are getting your details and therefore are able to get to you before the parcel does. And therefore, to be honest, you're kind of none the wiser that actually you've been scammed, if I'm honest. Because you get a phone call, you get a text, you get an email, you pay the money, and then a couple of days later, the goods arrive. And you're actually no wiser that you've actually been done. So think about it from that point of view. Are you actually genuinely having to pay charges? Or have you been done in the past? That's something to really think about. I'm not sure you can see this, but this is my little friend who sits with me in the goldfish bowl. Um, we called him Wiggly Elf because he's a little solar powered elf that wiggles. He likes looking at the sun. <laughs> anyway, my experience, my experience. Um, so first thing is, if the seller gives you a tracking number, which they should do on most um, marketplace platforms now, they require a tracking number, especially for cross-border activity. Um, <clears throat> and definitely for the sort of the more expensive and larger items. Um, they have to give you a tracking number because of the insurance, because if something goes wrong, you need to know how you claim. Anyway, use the tracking number to find out where the item is. Don't accept the text, the email, or the phone call that you actually owe charges. And if somebody rings you up and says you owe charges, just politely say, I just need to check where the parcel is in the process, and then can you give me a number to ring you back on? And they won't. I can tell you that now. Um, but you can also quite often find out where the, 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 the item is. Now, things that go cross-border, um, quite often the, the, the protocol is that the company that sends it, so the company in the UK that I use to send the goods is responsible for getting the goods from this country to the next country, to wherever it's, it's, it's going to you know, it, the, the delivery addresses. 
So they are typically responsible for getting it into the country, but they don't do the customs clearance. The courier company they hand off to, if they hand off to a courier company, or the courier company or the part of the organisation that's in the local location, they tend to do the clearance. So they will do the clearance and they will contact you, the customer, to ask you for more money if there is customs and duty due. Okay, so that's kind of the way it works. It's it's very, it seems a little bit inefficient, but actually it's quite an efficient system because it means that the com the, com the the local company to the sender who has no relationship with the customs entity in the foreign country is not handling the customs clearance. Okay, so that's so that's the reason why it works that way. Um, so the first thing to look at is who is the handoff company on the other side and is the email or message coming from the company that's doing the, the delivery in the locality of the buyer and not from the seller. So that's the first thing. You can, you can normally get that from the tracking number. Definitely when I, I, I do international deliveries here, um, I quite often will see uh, an entry on the local courier site that says, go to the, this is the tracking number, go to the, the local company delivery website and then you can see what's going on in the, in the locality of the, of the buyer. Um, locally in the UK, the courier company writes to you. So if something comes into, into, into the UK that I've bought, uh, typically the courier will write to me. Okay, um, definitely the Royal Mail will. The Royal Mail will always write to you. They send you effectively a, a letter in a, what you, I suppose, you know, the old salary things with the tear off strips around the side. Um, and in that it will say there is a customs charge due and they will break the fees down. And that's another indication that, you, that you're being scammed if they just ask you for a number because the courier companies typically will break the fees down. Okay, so they will break them down into, it, in the UK it will be uh, value added tax, in other regions it could be sales tax, it could be described as something else. Um, then you have duty, which is effectively a levy they place on goods coming in and out of the country depending on what those goods are, it's a variable percentage of the value. Uh, and then there's typically, uh, which I think is just basically bunts money, but there is the custom clearance fee, which is an, an amount of money that all the couriers charge. In the UK, it's it's fairly static across all the couriers. It's the same amount, um, but it's a fixed fee for basically sending you a letter and collecting the money. That's what this is. And I suppose you know, they argue that it's the fee for dealing with custom, for, for customers and excise. But that's kind of what will be on the letter. And you can see where the money is, you know, how much you have to pay and where the money's been incurred. And as I say, quite often, you know, it's either, um, you always get the fixed fee. If you get a letter, you always get a fixed fee. So that's, you know, it's gone and by. Um, but the 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 duty uh, is, as I say, percentage of goods, and then VAT is a percentage of goods plus duty. So. That's how it works in this country. Um, you do not get emails necessarily, but if you do get an email, it comes from DHL.com, rawmail.com. Although I say in this country, we don't get them from raw mail. Um, DHL will write to you, FedEx write to you, um, UPS, I can't remember what UPS do, but I think they write to you as well. I think all the couriers actually physically put paper in the post. Um, so that you never click, uh, so you don't send an email. You might say, well, that's actually a bit daft. Um, why are they putting letters in the post? And I suspect the reason is because of this, the ability to be scammed. You might think the fastest way to do this is by email, and it probably is the fastest way to do it, but it's... Um, it is also a, a, a backdoor to being scammed. The other thing is, um, and this is the truth, you don't have to give email addresses or telephone numbers of the buyer. Now, I know what some sites do insist on certain pieces of information, but you don't actually have to give them. Um, and so, therefore, they don't actually have your telephone number and they don't have your, have your uh, email address. And therefore, 
they can't email you. But as I say, my experience here is that most of the customs charges I get are are by letter, a few I get by e by email. And if you do get them by email, here is, here is the trick. Don't click the link because you don't know where you're going. I said that before, you don't know where this thing is taking you to and what, 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 what's on the site. Always go, so if you get an email from dhl.com or fedex.com or ups.com, go to their website. So you go to their website with a browser and then it will have something there around fees to pay. There will be a link to a page that says fees to pay. You will have the item number in the email they sent you and if that item number can't be found, that's a pretty good indication it might be a scam because the item number, if, if there was a fee to pay and the item number was there, they would find it and present you with the, with the relevant page to pay the fees. Okay, so there's another good indication there. Um, and once you get to the website and you've done that, then you should be released. If you can't get, if the website doesn't know anything about this, pretty good idea, it's a scam, but you haven't clicked on a malicious link. You've gone to the website, and that's pretty much the way that most cybersecurity experts now are telling you to do this stuff. Uh, and the company I work for, they've just gone through a big exercise of telling people not to click links in emails. You know, if there is something you wanna know, and I know it seems the easiest thing to do, I wanna log on to a webinar, I wanna do this, I wanna do that, click the link, away you go. But what the, the internal security guys within the company are now turning around and saying, well, if you want to go and attend a webinar with, um, you know, so-and-so, then go to their website because the webinars will be listed on their website. And if they're not listed on the website, you know it's pretty much a scam. So I'm hoping that those few tidbits there, if you like, stop you getting scammed. It's becoming really, really, it's a really popular scam now. Um, the scammers all seem to be moving into this um, fees to pay postage scam uh, scenario. And I've, I've seen a lot more of it since Christmas this year. I really have seen a huge increase in the amount of text messages and emails I get saying that I have fees to pay on goods that are gonna be delivered. And I know they're not because being broke, I'm not ordering anything. So there you go, that's the easiest thing. If you haven't ordered anything, how can you have anything, anything to pay? But I've got um, things from uh, companies like in the UK, we have a company called HelloFresh. They deliver you uh, effectively a box of ingredients for you to cook your own meal. So you get a box that lasts five days or so with recipe cards and stuff like that. I've had emails from them. I've never had anything from HelloFresh in my entire life, so I can't be having a delivery. Um, I've had the obligatory uh, post office, DHL, um, text messages. I've had text, text from um, uh, Amazon telling me that there were, good, there were fees to pay on my Amazon delivery. Well, I can tell you now, Amazon don't work that way, that way because you order from Amazon local territory. And if something comes from abroad, Amazon tell you in their interface and they charge you the fees when you place the order. So it doesn't get hit in customs. So that's obviously a, uh, another way. But the classic where, where most of this stuff is gonna come up, I think is gonna be around the whole eBay experience because eBay, unless you use the eBay sending system, which as I said, I don't use because I find it cumbersome and slow um, and costly. Um, but if you don't use the eBay system or any of the other sort of kind of marketplace scenarios, they're the areas where if you buy something on one of those marketplaces, that's where you're potentially going to get scammed. Anyway, avoid the scammers. Live long and prosper. See you next time. Bye-bye.